pointing me in the room. It's pointing down. It's like reverse. Hello. Hi. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for Social Justice Week. Um, today, we wanted to welcome Dayton Andrews, Dale Smith, and Dominic Muro. Dayton Andrews is an LA native and alumnus of the University of California at Santa Cruz. He graduated with a bachelor's in economics in 2015. As a resident of Oakland, much of his activism has sought to combat gentrification in the Bay Area. Working with colleagues and other homeless activists, they have formed a community organization, the United Front Against Displacement, and have spent the last two years building res resistance to criminalization in many of the Bay Area's massive homeless communities, while also working to unite homeless struggles with tenant struggles. You can find them on Twitter at the UFAD. Hi, um, my name is Dominic, uh, Dominic Andrews, and um, I um, am working with the United Front Against Displacement, and um, do a lot of yeah community organizing, going out there to uh, homeless encampments, and um, also trying to uh, fundraise for things. That's mainly what I do. My name is Dale Smith. I'm also with the United Front Against Displacement. I've been a political political activist and organizer in San Francisco and the Bay Area for a little over three years. I'm also a student at City College of San Francisco and a sexual health educator. All right. Um, so uh, that was, you know, us and. Um, our uh, organization, the United Front Against Displacement, was founded by house people and homeless people to fight back against displacement of working people by real estate development and the criminalization of working people made to live on the street. Um, uh, a basic overview of the situation in Oakland regarding uh, homelessness and housing, um, like some key uh, points that we're trying to raise uh, awareness on are the rise in housing prices. Um, rents, rents have remained high, um, even if housing prices have gone down in the past couple of years. Um, stagnant wages, uh, federal minimum wage has remained the same for a few decades, despite the fact that productivity and profits have increased since the 70s and the amount of money a worker gets is minuscule compared to that. Um, also, I want to talk about the number of homeless people. Um, there's about 4,000 on the streets, we could say, but it could also be twice as high because there's no um, actual census uh, being taken for people that maybe live outside of um, shelters um, and uh, that are just, um, or tuck sheds and stuff. Um, and that are more on the streets. And um, also uh, the number of shelter beds, there's maybe about 600 provided by the city and uh, a couple uh, hundred beds offered by other nonprofits. Um, this uh, really influences maybe the demographics of homeless people. Um, and uh, also, um, a few people that I would like to uh, mention just to give you a background on some folks that we work with. <clears throat> um, Jesse has lived uh, on Wood Street where we you know visit regularly. Um, he's lived on Wood Street for eight years. He um, after prison um, he was in subsidized housing and faced difficulties like discrimination racially and then also because he was an ex-con. Um, he was just having problems with his neighbors and it wasn't worth it for him to deal with um, that kind of stuff. So he um, you know, made his way out of there, which led to him being homeless and on Wood Street. Um, 
Natasha uh, has been on Wood Street for about six months. She was evicted from her childhood home. Uh, she was targeted by like a predatory speculator who tried to buy her house from uh, under her and succeeded. Um, and uh, so she's there now. And uh, also uh, Gary, Gary, he used to he used to own um, Sweet Jimmy's, which was a downtown Oakland club. It was really popular, uh, but he lost his business, and uh, soon after he also lost his house, which caused uh, him and his wife to uh, like move into like multiple hotels at first, where um, then you know that was really costly. So they ended up on the street and um, like. Uh, he had prior medical conditions and an infection, and uh, sadly, a month ago, he died from those complications and a drug overdose, um, two weeks before he was supposed to um, get into an apartment uh, from Veterans Affairs. And um, I just wanted to mention those people. Um, these are some people that we've gotten really close to that are like every, I don't know, it could be anybody, um, such, such just people of the community from different backgrounds, you know, childhood homes, uh, just being, you know, gr growing up there, um, trying to, you know, or having a business, business owners, like so many people are susceptible to uh, falling into homelessness. And um, yeah, that's a part. Hey, everybody. So just to pick up from that. So the United Front Against Displacement is dominantly active in the neighborhood of West Oakland in the SFA area. Uh, this is a photo to, uh, as you can see on the slide right there, this is from one of the first rallies we held in October of 2018. And so by that point, we've already been doing weekly outreach in the neighborhood for close to six months, really trying to learn about tenant struggles. But during that time, we actually made a lot of uh, breakthroughs in terms of building relationships with the local and home homeless community. Specifically, a lot of the folks uh, vehicularly housed people. So this specifically on the presentation right here is from a, a protest of RV dwellers. So in October of 2018, there was a mass towing with the city of Oakland towed about 20 different vehicles that had been parked in a, a commercial sector of West Oakland. And so you know, 20 vehicles were just towed in a single morning that left pretty much over 40 people uh, with nothing. They'd been safely uh, habitating inside vehicles. And so, just like uh, some of the profiles we gave you is that one gentleman in the far back corner with the hat, that's Gary. So Gary was one of the first activists that we worked with as part of the United Front Against Displacement. And we kind of met him at probably his worst day. You know, he came out looking through piles of his stuff, trying to gather what he could as his neighbors around him were losing everything. And through talking to him, you know, he said to us, you know, I've never protested a day in my life, but today I'm ready to fight. And so a week later, we parked his RV right next to Oakland City Hall. That's where we're literally right in a little cop loading zone. So there's a couple cop cars right behind where that photo is. So we're hassling us as we take this photo. It's a really good time. Um, but just go more into the history of the neighborhood is that what we've really seen is the community in that whole neighborhood really stagnate over the last 30 years as a lot of industrial production has moved out. Um, and in these areas is the entire, most of the Bay Area rapidly switches over to being a commercial economy. So there are whole sections of the, com of the community that are no longer able to be employed anymore in usual industries. We also have a rapidly aging population as a lot of the younger folk have been pushed out from, once again, the rising costs of living. And so the area where we tend to be operating on Wood Street is in right in the heart of what used to be an industrial sector, which has now been mostly been reduced to really mostly abandoned property. There's about 220 acres of abandoned property in the uh, abandoned, underutilized property in the entire area of West Oakland. Um, but as we've seen, as really speculation has really taken off, as uh, real estate is beginning to be developed, we see a lot of these abandoned, underused property being uh, basically redeveloped, or rather attempts to redevelop this land. But the only issue is, is that you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of people have started informally habitating on these areas. And so this used to be, you know, an area, once again, of a thriving economy, but also thriving political activism. This is the neighborhood in which the Black Panther Party was founded. And I think what really inspired us to actually take a more serious approach was actually, you know, talking with longer-term residents 
and actually hearing of these legacies of ongoing political struggle, specifically for workers' rights, against police brutality, against corruption, and largely against capitalist exploitation. And really how the absence, the absence of that act, act, uh, the activism in the following years, uh, after the collapse of the party, really did see uh, the collapse of a lot of that same popular struggle and spirit in the neighborhood. So as we have literally hundreds and hundreds of people on the streets, you know, there's not really an adequate way for the people, but that people feel that they can respond. And so the basic idea that we put forth in the United Front Against Displacement, specifically in the city of Oakland, is that we believe that the city of Oakland has not adequately worked to address the rising homelessness of working people. Um, particularly as we look through just the rapid uh, development of neighborhoods in Oakland, as we see the rapid investment of outside companies in Oakland, we actually don't really see opportunities trickling down to the actual the residents of Oakland, oddly um, enough. Uh, we see you know, thousands of people being pushed out year to year. I mean, we see new developments coming up in all these neighborhoods that used to be once working class neighborhoods. In that neighborhood alone, they've uh, opened a, a lift uh, office building over there. There's, new condos sprouting up that are mostly vacant. So there's all this investment that's being pushed forward by the city of Oakland, but not even basic services for the people living on the streets. So, um, I just wanna, I think I'll just show you all some photos. Let's go to the beginning of our presentation. Oh, this mic's live as well. And so this photo right here is from a memorial ceremony that we held a couple weeks ago. This was to commemorate some of the recent folks who've lost. Uh, the woman in the front row right there, that's Ramona. Ramona was actually commemorating her father. Her and her father had actually been homeless in the same neighborhood together. Unfortunately, as he got more and more sick, he actually, ironically enough, got the opportunity to move into hospice care, uh, where he did eventually pass from multiple health complications. That middle row right next to me is uh, Martha Rosenquist. Her, her husband was Gary Rosenquist, our, the first activist in the United Nations Displacement, who ended up passing in January as well. And so this is really an opportunity for us to really bring residents together, to really commemorate the folks that have lost, that they've lost recently. But not just commemorate them, because ultimately these people have been actually very foundational in maintaining this informal community, really actually putting forth the idea that people should actually work together. Right in the front row of this, you, know, you can't really see as well, is the community garden that residents came together that same day to build. So the, there's Patrick, it's watering the garden. What we found, we, we were able to source all this grow dirt from just the surrounding lots. What we find is because of the reputation for lack of cleanliness in homeless encampments, we find contractors specifically target homeless encampments for illegal dumping particularly as all the construction projects require an influx of construction companies and contractors, there's also an increased need for these contracts to then dump their waste. And rather than spending a few hundred dollars at a local dump yard, uh, they dump it in people's front doorsteps a lot of the times. But fortunately, ironically, it actually created the basis for us to build a very beautiful community garden a couple weeks back. And so I briefly just want to show you sort of what uh, the jet, what kind of uh, took off after our first rally in front of City Hall. And just give you a little example of some of the, what we, some of our protests we do look like. So this right here is a video clip taken during our first eviction events. Uh, also in October, 2018, that was quite a month. Essentially, um, the, the neighborhood of the, the community, West Oakland Wall Street community sits on three different types of property. One is property owned by the city of Oakland. Uh, second has been abandoned property that is private land. It's been recently been purchased by one Fred B. Craves. He's a San Francisco billionaire. And the third being Cal Caltrans land, uh, land owned specifically by the state of California. And so in this clip, some OPD officers are trying to displace uh, the section of the community that lives on some of the abandoned private property. So, not good. Come on. Hello, we will go. 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 Hello,
And they went, which is pretty shocking for us because at that point we'd only ever seen cops give orders, had those orders be followed, and if they didn't, people got arrested. But what we found is by actually bringing neighbors out into these encounters, actually politicizing these confrontations beyond just you know uh, simple charity work, we we're actually able to scare the cops off. They're in the middle of giving out orders when they actually saw this rally come about, and they you know scratched their heads, looked around for a little bit, but then quickly walked off. Um, and they were gone for well over a year. So that's Jesse right there on the right. And that's Mona right there, one of the other volunteers. And this is from a quote from our second eviction defense. And so this was in November of this of 2019. So as we can see just from this photo right here, we had more people participating in the picket, but we also had over 50 personnel involved from Oakland Police Department. So we've had to actually uh, build a political campaign against uh, growing police opposition, but also growing solidarity to be able to involve more people in this campaign. This is another rally we did just a couple weeks ago. This is actually targeting uh, the law firm of Alan Horowitz. Alan Horowitz is a local uh, real estate lawyer who specifically uh, focuses in on tenant evictions. His website calls himself The Evictors, Alan Horowitz and The Evictors, helping you get rid of problem tenants. So specifically right here is us trying to draw a clear link between homelessness and uh, predatory uh, landlord practices, specifically with uh, predatory eviction. As we can see with these lobby signs, a lot of folks you see on the stage here are a lot of the house people. However, these signs were all made in the homeless encampments. So we have to find a lot of different sort of creative ways to involve different people from different backgrounds. You know, in the encampments, there's a higher incidence of uh, disability as for one particular level. So folks that have maybe a lot of uh, less capacity, say, involved in more traditional forms of activism, we were actually trying to create more opportunities for people to make. So we actually made these signs, and ultimately we tacked them up all over this door frame behind them. Our, our, we were actually quite successful with getting this action, because actually, we were actually able to get the law firm actually close out for an entire day, just by actually just sending a press release out. We ended up didn't showing up into their office until, I like, think, an hour before they were formally supposed to close, but they closed. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, and this is a couple of quotes from some of the commu community programs, and I am going to now defer to Gail. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, who we are as an organization, what we do um, more specifically. So just in general, we're a, a political organization, a mass organization that seeks to unite a broad group of people along different ideological tendencies uh, among a common goal, you know, which is really to you know, push back against displacement, push back against criminalization, you know, build community up and find ways that we can work together to really not only just maintain the community, but find ways that it can flourish and ultimately push back against oppressive forces, forces like, um, you know, property owners or developers or the police or the government. Um, so that being said, you know, we're not a nonprofit or an NGO. I think it's important to make this distinction, not because you know, we can't work with those people and aren't looking to actively work with those people, but oftentimes we find that there's a sort of a individualist mindset that comes along a lot of the time when people are involved specifically in nonprofit and NGO activism, um, seeing that they're more concerned with their career. I've directly had, you know, a lot of, you know, people who worked for nonprofits that supposedly uh, represent the interests of people experiencing homelessness say that they don't think that homeless people can organize. And I think that's BS. I think that every, everybody's able to organize, especially those that are, you know, experiencing some of the, you know, the worst um, oppressions that anybody can face in our society. Um, but, you know, and also another thing that I think is really with a lot of, you know, nonprofits and NGOs, they do have a tendency to think about their career and like maintaining their relationships with people that have power instead of working with other people, building power with them and really trying to do that from the bottom up. So we really try and emphasize a collective approach, you know, making sure that we're all working together to take care of tasks so that not only does it not fall on one, one person, but we're all able to, you know, contribute in a way that 
builds us, you know, builds our skills together. So over time, people who might not have ever been involved in any sort of activism before feel more confident in public speaking, making flyers, making, uh, you know, different life signs, um, you know, actively engaging in political discussions with people, studying over um, long amounts of time to really like clarify these key political ideas and try and figure out what the best way is forward. And so, you know, we think it's really important to emphasize that we, a lot of the work that we do is through community engagement and support. It's by going to where people are at, talking to them, having regular conversations with them, you know, seeing what their needs are, seeing what, you know, is going on with them, and then finding ways we can support them while also trying to, you know, clarify certain ideas around what's happening. Um, you know, people in general are pretty aware of the situation. Um, but we do still feel it's important to make sure that this information isn't spreading so that way we're able to kind of strengthen the bonds of the community as opposed to just um, you know one example is uh, with the initial protests that happened like a year and a half ago one you know resident of the community who is actually pretty controlling and most of the other residents see them as themselves as a community leader but doesn't really emphasize you know people building power together they were lying to people and telling people the reason why the cops left is because they got everybody to sign a lease. And that's mm -hmm. not true. They never actually did that. And they actually took money from people in the process. So, um, you know, we really feel it's important to clarify these different ideas in order to, you know, um, show people that the best way forward is for us to work together, you know. Um, so, you know, we really want to emphasize building leadership within the community, you know, to wage struggle against these oppressive forces that they face. It can be really daunting at times. Um, especially when people are having uh, the you know potential resources or housing dangled over their head, but we feel like it's still really important to clarify with folks like, hey, like you know, these folks are always saying that you're going to get a house, that you're going to get help with this sort of thing, but regardless of what you do, they never do it. You know, and you have to think about why that is and like what are different ways that we can work together to push back against that. Um, so if you know eventually somebody does want to get you know, out of Wood Street or into a little bit better of a situation, a little bit more secure, we're able to work towards that, but also understanding that um, it's going to come through us working together as opposed to somebody, some social worker just showing up and being like, hey, I'm going to give you a house next week if you do X, Y, and Z. Because most of the time that's not going to happen. Um, so one thing we also really want to emphasize is to encourage political development and, you know, um, studying. This happens at different levels. Um, you know, we think it's important to clarify different political ideas that might come up to try and stress a, a collective approach as opposed to an individual approach. And uh, also just in trying to bring a large group of people together, both inside, you know, the community and from outside the community, people are all at different stages of political development. And we don't think it's necessarily a good idea to try and exclude people right off the bat, um, unless if they are showing that they're really, they have some really opportunistic tendencies, they're really just trying to control the situation or potentially just use it for their own benefit as opposed to actually actively participating in the struggle and working with other people to try and push the struggle forward. Um, and one thing, you know, one last thing just on like why we're different and what we do is like, you know, we think it's important to connect this to broader struggles as well. Um, you know, these struggles related to, you know, displacement and criminalization and homelessness are connected to, you know, broader struggles around imperialism, around against capitalism, you know, against just these larger, broader systemic um, oppressions and systems that exist that keep people in these positions. Um, so some of the different programs that we have just in general are, you know, we try and lead forward with a weekly outreach. So this is different from like uh, outreach that different like NGOs or social workers might do. Not that we're trying, not that we're not trying to provide people with resources and help them out where we can, but also really, like I said before, emphasizing that the best way forward for people to end up in a better situation is if we work together. Um, so one of the things that we also really try and do is to try and learn from the residents about different things that have been going on, trying to spread this information to other residents so there can be some clarity about the present situation on Wood Street or around homelessness in general in Oakland or the Bay Area, and then to also counter disinformation um, because word can travel really quick and it can be good or bad and really feel like it's important to clarify some of these, you know, some of the disinformation that comes out, like, for example, with the lease situation or, you know, if there's like a predator that's, you know, targeting specific people, 
Um, we want to make sure that we know like exactly what's going on, not to sow like some sort of discord or fear into people, not that it might not be justified, but just so that we know what's happening so we can figure out what's the best way to deal with this sort of situation. Um, another thing that was uh, has come up at organically through our work with residents is they felt there would be a strong need for community dinners. And so um, initially we started doing community dinners monthly. Now hopefully it's bi-monthly, so uh, once every other Wednesday. Um, we invite you know neighbors to come hang out, meet each other, and just like a chill environment. Um, given you know how hectic things can be, it's good to have just like a couple hours where we're just hanging out, eating some food, talking to each other, listening to music. You know, um, it's also a great place to provide updates on what's been happening, what our actions in the past have looked like, what's been going on in the community, and what are some different things that we're trying to work on together. Uh, solicit feedback for different ideas that people have brought up or that we've come up with um, just to see what people think is going to stick what's not what would be most helpful to different folks and ultimately just to have a good time you know just so people are, are in good spirits and we also feel um, you know just between weekly outreach and just community dinners these are really good entry points for people who are coming in from outside of the community who want to be involved in the struggle want to take this stuff seriously or are just curious as to what's happening and meeting some of the different activists and residents and community members. Um, so through these we've been able to put together um, more concerted community meetings where there is also dinner but the main purpose of these is to work through ideas for programs and different actions that we're thinking about uh, regarding um, what are the next steps forward you know this is how we came up with our ideas for um, you know different protests we've done in the past couple months, whether it's been showing up to Alan Horowitz in the evictor's office to, you know, the mayor of Oakland State of the City address. Um, we're really trying to figure out different ways that we can, you know, continue the struggle, potentially escalate actions and actually create some meaningful change in people's everyday lives. Um, and we really want to emphasize, you know, empowering and encouraging residents to take charge on these different issues. Um, we really, you know, take to heart what the difference residents have to say um, really trying to figure out like what might make the best sense tactically, but ultimately like having them have a stake in what we're going to do next. It's not just the people coming in from outside of the community being like, hey, we're going to do this. We're actually actually participating in these discussions with the you know members of the community being like, hey, what do you think about this? Like, what would you think would be the best idea? And then trying to take the steps to make those things come to fruition. And just in general, community meetings are a great place for updates on things we've been doing in the past and want to do in the future. Uh, something we've done fairly recently is put together a community newsletter. Uh, so this is, once again, to keep the community informed about past and uh, future actions and events to so allow residents to speak their mind and express themselves. Uh, it's really powerful that we've been able to gather quotes where we have an interview plan from a different community in the area. Uh, for our next newsletter, we have a piece from one of the residents that we're going to publish in there as well. So it's a it's an outlet for different people to talk about these different issues or even to express themselves creatively, which we feel like is really important. Um, and it's also a great way to lead on the outreach that we're trying to do and these conversations that we have with people from the first time, both inside and outside of the community. Um, having something to show them that gives them a general rundown of like what's happening in the community and what we're doing in the future allows people to feel a real sense of community and feel like they actually can have a stake in you know, their everyday lives as opposed to just feeling like they need to constantly isolate themselves, especially when, you know, bad things might happen. A um, couple other things. So, you know, one more, two more things that we do, you know, we organize protests and rallies. It's really to continue to wage this uh, popular struggle against displacement, against criminalization, against these broader, broader systems of oppression. Um, we really want to empower, you know, allies from outside of the community, but especially residents who um, it can be, you know, difficult at times because, like I said, people oftentimes have like, you know, it's like the carrot and stick approach. It's like, oh, well, if you don't do this, like, you know, I won't, you know, I'll give you housing, but if you do it, I might not, but realistically, they're not ever going to reach that carrot um, unless we work with them to show them that it's just a flaw that we need to work together. Um, so that can be something that, you know, we have to work over around time. Um, at the very least, we feel like a lot of the actions that we've done have been effectively like a, a spoke jam. So they've been able to like slow down some of these different processes that have happened, um, if not causing them to go to a full halt 
like last November when we had uh, over two dozen, you know, allies come in from outside of the community to push back against the city's attempts to tow everybody's RVs away. Initially, they were just going to tow people's RVs, take their stuff, and that would be it. But because we had such strong support from outside of the community, uh, people didn't actually get their stuff moved unless they were explicitly asked and they felt like that would be a good thing for them. Um, and ultimately, nobody ended up having their RVs taken. Nobody had anything taken away. You know, we were able to really push back against the police and the city's attempts to displace people even further um, through the lies that they were trying to tell. Um, and then, yeah, one, one thing that's really important is even though some of the actions that we do may be somewhat symbolic, we feel it really is important to, you know, demonstrate how these do pave the way for future actions um, and able to do able to do certain things and even having these smaller victories like making sure that people don't have their stuff taken like shutting down these law offices for the day it shows that we can actually you know wage these starters on a broader level if we're just more coordinated and you know make a more concerted effort and then the last point as far as like things that we do you know um, you know community support is really important just making sure we're meeting the basic needs of the community this is something we're constantly having to re-examine um, but, you know, it could just be as simple as like, oh, like so-and-so needs a ride to the doctor. Um, so-and-so would like a tarp because it's been raining recently. You know, we've been able to do um, small things for now, but hopefully over time this will build up, especially as, you know, allies from outside of the community see, you know, the positive work that we've been doing, the developments that have happened within the past couple of years and are willing to, you know, throw down as well. Um, and yeah, it's important to just show solidarity with the residents of the community because you know, ultimately, like we're trying to build real relationships with people. Um, we're doing this because we care about the people that are there. They're, they are our friends, you know, and we want to make sure that, um, you know, we're showing them that we're in this for the long haul. We're not just going to disappear one day for whatever reason, because we're, we're committed to the struggle. And so um, just as the last point, I just want to go through some successes and some limitations that we've had through the work that we've been doing, because we feel like it's, it's good to be clear about this stuff. So. Um, I guess I'll just start with the limitations to end on a more positive note. Um, so, you know, one of the big limitations that we've dealt with is, is uh, breaking the volunteer mindset. So this idea that um, there's, you know, just kind of ideas that some people have where it's like, oh, I can volunteer for everything, but then not actually commit to anything, you know, or I can just show up once in a while. And uh, that's, that's going to do a lot. Like it is good when people do show up when they can. But at the same time, like if people treat, are treating it more like a hobby instead of like a serious, you know, task that need to be done, it can really hinder um, some of the stuff that we're trying to do, especially when we're planning around, you know, people who might say like, oh, yeah, I'm going to come out on outreach this week and then they end up not showing up, you know, that can, that can really hinder our efforts in some ways. Uh, networking can be a little bit tough sometimes too, uh, just generally because like some of these different organizations don't necessarily um, see eye to eye on the need for like a broader struggle um, and we try and do our best to you know go to other people's actions and other things that are going on to work with other folks um, and we have made some you know strides in this area like I said before with um, some of y'all might have heard about the encampment at, or the community at 37th and MLK that was put together by all women you know in the Oakland area we've been trying to work with them more um, a lot more recently and are trying to work with a lot of these other communities in the area to try and you know, develop these links over time. So there have been some you know, successes in the past couple months around this. Um, just the general precarity of people's situation makes it really difficult sometimes because things might come up or there might be some sort of crisis that comes up that really kind of hinders our ability to do some of these things. Um, but, you know, we, we try to address these when they come up. Um, you know, financial limitations, you know, most of the people that we work with um, that come in from outside of the community work a nine to five. So it's not like we have like this endless pool of money and like grants and because of these relationships we've built with like different like nonprofits or whatever. Um, but, you know, ultimately it's not about just having money, you know? And so we're, find, we're finding ways to work around this. And then, um, you know, dealing with anti, kind of anti-people ideas is also a very difficult task. We still see there's a basis to work with people in general, even if they might kind of have more like um, patriarchal or misogynistic or sometimes racist views. Um, and it's important to clarify like why, you know, ultimately these are different ideas that people might develop over time. 
um, to really divide people as opposed to bring them together against a common, you know, a common oppressor uh, in a common struggle. Um, and so we, we try our best to kind of work through these things as they come up to really try and emphasize that we're trying to bring people together, not separate them. Um, and then so something we've had a little bit more, a little bit of success with and are working on is clarifying different political ideas. We feel like we've done a lot of positive work around clarifying ideas within the given situation on Wood Street and in general, but trying to, you know, it's really a constant struggle to try and, you know, demonstrate how what people are experiencing in the streets of West Oakland or in the Bay Area in general is connected to these broader struggles against capitalism, against imperialism, against patriarchy, against white supremacy, you know, they're all interrelated. And so it's important to really stress that point. But to end on some, you know, positive, positive things that we feel like have happened through our work. Um, just in general, building community through relationships, trying to bring people together. Um, we feel like within the past couple of years, um, it's gone, you know, there's been some progress from people just being generally distrustful of everyone or the vast majority of people to people wanting to participate in some of our different community programs, people wanting to show up to these different actions and really seeing the need for you know, people coming together to deal with the different you know, forces that they might deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that are really pushing them down. Um, just in general, showing solidarity with folks, um, you know, standing with them in their times of need, you know, really taking what people have to say seriously and, and working with them. Um, trying to empower residents. Um, you know, we feel like it's really important to put what they have to say over like what the, you know, people coming from outside of the community have to say first, not to say that we can't, you know, try and clarify some different ideas that might come up or that we don't have good ideas of our own, but at the end of the day, you know, the struggle we're trying to wage against displacement, against criminalization, needs to be waged by the people that are experiencing this on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, slowing down the just general process of displacement and criminalization. Uh, we feel like there's been a lot of success around that, um, you know, to the point where even though a bunch of people did move off of the immediate lot on Wood Street that is owned by Game Changer LLC and Fred Craves, uh, we do feel like there's a basis for people to potentially move back within the next couple of months, especially if the, uh, you know, especially if the legal proceedings keeps uh, going pretty slow. Um, I might be speaking ahead of myself, but just in general, like just being able to like deal with this stuff regularly kind of shows that like, um, you know, if people are really able to come together, we're able to push back against this stuff and, you know, slow down the process of displacement. Um, you know, we've come up with different examples of how people have been able to avoid, you know, their RVs getting towed, their stuff getting taken, you know, um, you know, meeting people's needs is also really, you know, something I feel like we've done a pretty good job with really trying to take what people have to say seriously when they say they need help with something and just showing like consistency, like being doing this stuff on a consistent basis, going on outreach every week, doing these community dinners every couple of weeks, you know, really engaging with com conversations with people on a regular basis, um, just to show that we are really committed to this work and that it's really important to, you know, kind of push forward with this stuff and not just like decide one day it's like, oh, like, you know, it's important for us to push through our own personal barriers in order to actually work with people um, because ultimately that's what it's going to take. It's going to take, you know, individual progression over time for people really trying to figure out, all right, what are the next steps I, that I can take to try and bring this to another level as opposed to just being complacent in, in where we're at. And um, yeah. Uh, do y'all have anything else to add? This would be a great time to get some questions. Yeah. <laughs> I have to acknowledge I just walked in the room. Yeah, that's so, all right, man. And again, there are lots of people who are, who are activists within the um, movement to help homeless people. Um, so I haven't heard who you're connected with, and that's a repeat for everybody. So.
actually make the police more aware. Right? Yet the police takes a lot of courage and thinking and planning to actually be able to put yourself down. Right. So my question for you all would be that you know what is this kind of urgent issue in our community that we need to put solidarity around and how do we get it there? Anyone? What are what do you think is urgent things that are in our community? In this community? Like changing walls? No, in this community is what you're saying? Yeah. I would say one, human trafficking is a very big prominent issue in this area. Um, the cost of living out here, cost of housing. Mm -hmm. So so housing issues, right? And human trafficking issues. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just really surprised that the, the local um, advocates aren't here to, to be listening to this. I'm kind of stunned by it. But I, I would I would say we we do need to point out all the connections, you know, income inequality, housing, homeless, healthcare. They're they're all essentially the same subject. And being able to get that message so that people understand that they're not working in isolation but supporting each other. Others? Any ideas about how then we can build solidarity? Right, so let's say following our ideas, meaning that you know, a lot of issues will be played that actually you know, unite them, right? Like possible. We will actually you know, take over that question. Capital solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can I ask, are there other groups that you work with that are specific? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, we're doing like a thing where we, we work with a lot of different words. So uh, we are also working with uh, the Revolutionary United Front, which um, which ha houses a lot of different smaller orgs, like the United Front Against Displacement, and uh, like uh, meeting up for like the actions where the well, just meeting up for actions in general, we don't just outreach to the people that are in our group. We outreach via text message to like a, a, a whole bunch of people. When the Moms for Housing was going on, we, everyone was getting uh, updates. And uh, I mean, we likewise go out and are there for them as much as they are there for us. I mean, just some examples of different organizations that we've worked with. Um, you know, we've worked with organizations like Poor Magazine, um, Poor People's Campaign. Um, let's see, a uh, bunch of bunch of like smaller community groups, um, the local homeless advocacy working group. Um, we're looking to build links with other kind of larger orgs like Casa Justa, um, Foods Not Bombs. Uh, yeah, so those are just a couple of examples. Um, most of the time when we work with people, it is on like a one-to-one -one basis, uh, but we are looking to, you know, work with larger community organizations um, like Casa Gusta, Food Not Bombs, and like, for example, like the 37th and MLK community in West Oakland to really like collaborate on different things and connect with different struggles that we can. But, um, have, have you found what I find in Sonoma County is that sometimes one is considered too radical to work with. You know, you'll find that an organization that you think would be simpatico um, looks at you and says, uh, I might end up with the socialist taint if I work with you. Um, do you find any of that happen? Is that something you encounter? Well, we find that that uh, mindset comes from state agencies and nonprofit groups more than any other organization, specifically because what we find is that within this nonprofit industrial complex, nonprofit NGO organizations have to have some type of working rapport with the people that oppress working people. And so we find these absurd little conclusions that groups make in order to preserve funding that they don't want to be considered too adversarial 
to the people who are openly adversarial toward their so-called support base, specifically around the issue of policing, in which we will find many of organizations that will speak out actively against, say, issues of criminalization, what actually comes to, say, you know, directing an antagonistic you know, protest toward the police actually very much you know, shrink away. I mean, initially, you know, we've had some of our initial work sort of reaching out to some uh, nonprofit groups. We had really had to break out this mindset that homeless people, communities of color, have to have sit-downs with local police departments. Uh, we find that's absolutely frivolous for the people that want to sue somebody to have to then sit down and have a fruitless conversation with them in their headquarters when they're holding all the cards. It makes no sense. Um, but by making these clear stands, one, we actually find that there's a lot more support for these approaches amongst the people broadly than by, say, paid organizers. Because paid organizers have a lot more limitations than, say, people that are donating their own time for the struggle. Yeah, just as a, a kind of anecdote, I mean, when I first started working seriously with Dayton, I was a part of the DSA, although I'm the Democratic Socialist of America, although I'm no longer. Um, and like the first action that we did together, seriously working together, was around like the, um, the cold weather protocol that San Francisco had, which is still terrible. Um, but we decided to kind of put together a giant. Do you want to explain what that protocol is? Yeah, so basically uh, when the you know, temperature reaches a certain point in San Francisco, they're required to open up like X amount of shelter beds. Um, they ended up changing it by like five degrees, which is still, it's like 45 degrees, which is still like within the threshold that somebody can uh, experience frostbite. And people can you know, still be out in the rain. This was last year when we were having one of the worst hack, one of the worst storms that we've had in a decade. And so, you know, there are some people that I knew that were working around trying to engage with, um, you know, like the city and like the supervisors and these different departments to like have this hearing you know, but myself and Dayton and some of my other comrades were like, we'd rather take some more like radical action. And, um, you know, ultimately like what ended up happening is we had this action and then at the hearing, uh, all the heads of the departments weren't even there for public comment, you know? And after the fact, when I tried talking to them, one of which was Mohammed Nuru, who is now uh, in, in jail, jail. <laughs> he's in prison because of the whole SBI investigation, they were blatantly, you know, lying about um, you know, what was really happening in the meeting, what the real policy is. And, um, you know, I found that, you know, with some of these organizations that really claim to, you know, that are NGOs that are nonprofits, not that they don't do good work, like sometimes they really do prioritize, like sitting down with, you know, people who hold an immense amount of power, who have shown that they are extremely corrupt. And like really just, you know, talking about how bad that was as opposed to like really trying to build relationships with people that are dealing with this stuff every single day, you know, and I think that's really something that's important to emphasize. Um, it is important to bring a broad coalition of different groups together, but we're not trying to represent organizations, we're trying to represent people, you know, and it's about bringing, bringing people together, you know, ultimately. Um, you know, organizations come and, and go, not to say that our organization is like frivolous or not important, but like, at the end of the day, it's about building up this popular struggle collectively. Um, yeah. yeah, just a little bit of context. This city of San Francisco is having an exploratory hearing on their cold weather policy, which had been in place for over 32 years. Mm -hmm. So after 32 years of not creating uh, emergency shelters for people on the street, they decided to have an exploratory hearing on it. So it was, honestly to us, this was obviously a sham hearing. It was not actually an opportunity. It was made very evident by the fact that none of the department heads actually attended their own hearing. They presented on their policy and then left. And so 100 people presented public comment for over four hours to an empty room. And that was what the uh, position that was put forth by the homeless advocates, that we had to participate in an empty public comment. So we put out a different idea that we had to actually loudly protest uh, this sham. Uh, yeah, And a lot of you couldn't actually get that, right? A lot of you, you know, wasn't even able to actually buy things, you know, things to drink to protect yourself. But think about if we actually had a different mentality, if we come together and demand that all tests be free, and then also that anyone who's sick, right, due to coronavirus, you automatically get disability free, right? Imagine that would be very different in the way we organize the issue. 
right? And it'll be way more effective in terms of how we are going to put our human energy, right? And it would require not everyone to stand up, but a few to actually convict, convince individuals to actually be able to push the, the agenda. But you will have to, you know, be you know, able to recognize that you want to be one to actually, you know, extend your solidarity. Yeah. Well, I think just to explain a little bit more of the context, the city of Oakland, just as one example, has about $37 million set aside to deal with homelessness, but it can only account for about $4 million of those dollars. So there's, you know, $33 million the city of Oakland refuses to actually spend on homeless people. We have a similar example of Orange County, which actually had to be sued um, by the state of California to actually disperse their homelessness funds. So we really find this issue where cities and so governments are really hesitant to actually use the money they have set aside for social programs. It will be clear that the West Oakland Wood Street community is one of the largest uh, homeless communities in Oakland with anywhere from one to 300 people living in there, but there's not one single hand washing station. There's not one working porta potty And the city of Oakland has refused to actually provide expanded services uh, to different unhoused communities. So as we see different things like the coronavirus coming up, it's actually been almost no preparation at the local level for actually, for, you know, say, well, for uh, actually preparing for this, um, particularly for folks on, on the streets. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we've tried to do to address some of like the conditions that people face is, you know, we did craft a list of demands. We have tried to like harangue the, the mayor and city representatives to get them to meet some like very basic demands for people, you know, making sure that there are enough bathrooms, making sure that there's clean water, making sure that people have electricity and, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, and so we're on the verge at this point of really trying to craft a concrete proposal. Once again, you know, kind of demanding that the city um, put this forth. And if, you know, ultimately I'm not really that confident that they're actually gonna address some of this stuff. But at that point, if they decide not to, we'll hopefully take that to the broader community and be like, hey, like if they can't do it, like we're just gonna do it together, you know, and really demonstrate that the failings of these different um, you know, entities that are supposed to serve the people, but ultimately don't due to their inherent nature, you know, so. Here in Sonoma County, if the activists get together and grant the porta potties, for instance, please come in and haul it up immediately. Mm -hmm. Would we use some new color to see? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we've, we've had a declared homeless emergency in Sonoma County and Santa Rosa. And only this election, which is contested locally, has anything happened. And somebody was like, oh my God, look at this, we've got a problem. Even though they've had a declared emergency. Yeah. What we found in the Bay Area or in the East Bay is specifically is that the state of the emergency, rather than being like a tool to empower advocates and activists, has really been used by a tool to empower local law enforcement to actually deal with perceived growing public health issues. So one particular is, is we, uh, the city of Oakland issued a, uh, a shelter crisis ordinance, I think almost three years ago. And it was supposedly introduced in the mindset that would uh, encourage people to develop and build tiny homes on private land. So folks would donate some space in the private land and they allow people to uh, build tiny homes for folks. But what they actually found was that the city uh, would instead use that policy to actually erect its own uh, low cost emergency shelter programs known as the community cabin program. What we find is that the city will then put these places on, they'll clear homeless encampments and then just push them into these much smaller, uh, uh, smaller uh, sort of makeshift shanty towns using uh, ordinances that are meant to empower activists. And this is all at no cost to the city of Oakland. The city of Oakland has been able to privately raise funds claiming that it's gonna be used by putting in community hands to build dwellings but what they do is then they go down to the tough shed company, buy a bunch of tough sheds, put it out in a lot where they're gonna eventually build upon. And then they make a bunch of you know high need people become buckmates in a very uh, yeah, in a very unideal situation. When actually in reality, people are actually safer sleeping in their own cars than a lot of these uh, uh, hastily put together uh, uh, emergency programs. So what we've actually found is that a lot of times these crisis ordinances are once again actually empower. Uh, this local governments to actually put these little fluff programs without actually being systematic and saying what are the actual needs of people on the street and how can we use public funds to actually deal with them. We've had, we've had public funds being given
given to local um, homeless advocacy groups to build housing, but with no property to build them on. And being forbidden to put them on private property. But you put up a tiny home on a homeless pro on a private property, they come and say, nope, we don't have the code, you violated the code. It doesn't have two exits, it's a fire hazard. Right. Sorry, we have to pull exactly those. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we, you know, we've even seen like in Oakland with some of these uh, like transition, quote unquote, transitional programs that they put forth, the same rhetoric uh, that they use to justify trying to evict and displace people apparently doesn't apply to, you know, an RV where you have like less than five feet between them or, you know, when people literally live in a tool shed that's eight by eight, two people to it. Like apparently that's not a fire hazard, but when people actually get to build their own you know, small home out of like whatever they could find or put together, like that's a fire hazard. So there is a, a clear like a hypocrisy or contradiction within like the logic that the, you know, state applies to these sorts of situations. It's because they don't even recognize what is supposed to be people's rights. And, you know, we've seen this consistently in the Bay Area, um, you know, when the UN reporter came out, I believe last year, put together the report saying that one of the things that makes you know the homelessness crisis so bad is because people aren't even just allowed to just chill to just stay put you know to just have a place where they can be um, not that people should you know that we should aspire to have like a million shanty towns everywhere but if there's no place for people to go and they would rather live you know in a little home that they built themselves or their rv like they should at the very least have the ability to stay there until we're making sure that everybody has something that is considered adequate that anybody would like to live in. But, you know, I think, um, I mean, my comrades and I are somewhat unified in the idea that we don't really think that these, these, you know, these solutions are going to be put forth by the state and even in some of these situations by nonprofits or NGOs. It's really going to take building a broad movement to, to you know, kind of actually demand these, these greater reforms. Um, to provide a substance, substantive change to people's lives. And that sounds like a lot, but ultimately I think it's important to recognize that like you just gotta start small sometimes, you know? Like, I mean, it might just take, it might just be you and like one or two of your friends like trying to meet up every week, you know, study different things, actually going out, trying to talk to different tenants or different people that live in different communities. Um, but by showing, you know, by demonstrating that you're serious, taking the time to do this stuff consistently and showing other people that you're serious, things can really, you know, catch on pretty quickly. Um, so it can be kind of discouraging sometimes when it may not seem like there's a lot, a lot of things happening, but ultimately, like, you know, things, things are happening, even if you aren't sure if they are, when you put in the effort to make sure that they do. Like, I mean, I realized this yesterday when I was going on outreach, when, you know, the one resident who I mentioned before, with like the lease and, and stuff, um, for those that didn't hear it earlier, basically this one resident was trying to take advantage of other folks, claiming that the reason why they got, you know, the police to stop coming in was that they signed a lease with the property owner and that everybody should get the money and sign the lease, but that was BS. So this one resident was like trying to give some sort of justification for stopping our community barbecues. And, you know, I tried to take what they had seriously, but it was kind of difficult. Um, and what ended up happening was, you know, some of the other residents, like, you know, intervened at one point and, like, started talking to them and were like, hey, like, you know, like, we all like these barbecues. You know, you're the only person that really has an issue with what they're doing. You know, if you have some things that you would like out of this, like, you can tell them, but, like, don't threaten to, like, just end our barbecues, you know. And it did really just show that, like, this is something that the people had asked for. This is something that we had consistently shown that, you know, we could, we could give to people. And so now people in some ways are able to push back a little bit more than they were initially to deal with these folks who are really trying to take advantage of the situation to really kind of, um, you know, capitalize on this really kind of desperate situation for some folks um, and kind of work together in doing this. So um, it might be small steps along the way that might, you know, take a while to see them come to fruition or to come into perspective. But ultimately, you know, if you just start small, be consistent, things can grow really fast. So. And I will say there is there are small groups doing exactly that. Yeah, we can see a blue show here. Yes, I do.
there's also no reason why some of the people in this room can't start doing that if they aren't doing it already. You know, something to think about. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say that. Um, I mean, uh, a lot of people want to uh, just do this kind of thing because it's cool, like red cloud, social media, but like really you should help people if you can, not because of that. Um, you're good on time, but yeah, I, uh, um, I mentioned dogs on the street. They're also there. Yeah, lots of really cute dogs. Mm -hmm. People service animals. I mean, like literally, it feels like your neighbors are just out there, like, and uh, we do what we can for our neighbors. The dogs have become a big issue here in the Southern Sire. Huge group of house people who are using the dogs as the entry point to these dense tunnels, saying that the dogs are going to. And they go to greenhouse on the evening and they don't have to be the and they, they lose the dog. Well, San Francisco has more dogs than children. <laughs> so the issue isn't really dogs, they don't like dogs. The issue is they don't like other people's dogs or dogs not on leashes. Um, so many dogs not on leashes at Dolores Park. So many. Yeah, the one time my friend got bit by a dog was probably. Some house person's dog, you know. I think it's it's just kind of you know a lot of the time the, the plates that people have like are kind of an entry point for kind of dealing with these uh, you know issues in a really negative way. And I think it's important to understand you know one of the things that you know we see come up sometimes is that people often talk about like substance use, and um, the reality is that you know house people use substances at the same rates as unhoused people, you know. So. Um, realistically, like there isn't really a whole lot of difference between people's habits. It's just like where they're doing them. And most of the time people don't even really care about people's like well-being. They're just using it as an excuse to get them out of sight, out of mind, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know. Do we have any like, does anybody have any more questions or comments? Or? Since you brought up substance abuse. Much of the conversation is around if we solve someone's substance abuse problems, they would then be stable enough to do whatever they need to do to be housed. And so there's always, okay, we have, we're going to set up this camp or these little units or whatever, but build an apartment building, and it's going to come with wraparound service, which is where it's all going to be, which is partly about treating substance abuse. Um, my experience is that substance abuse is hard to treat in house people. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't appear to be the solution to me. I mean, I can see why it's desirable, but there's a lot of focus on it and it seems to me to be kind of a... Yeah, I mean, in general, there ground because you can't, because Truly, somebody who is who is housed and has a job may be an alcoholic, mm -hmm. and this is what's keeping them from being an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, like you know, these barriers to access aren't really created to help people. You know, if you really wanted to, like, I know in in some areas they've done what's known as like a housing first program, where it's like, all right, if people have other issues that they're dealing with. The best thing to do is make sure that they have housing to address these, you know, other issues that might come up. And there's a much higher success rate when you know people do that as opposed to like, oh, you have to like have a job, you have to be totally clean and sober, you have to, you know, do all. You have to go to like counseling twice a week at this place. All of these different caveats, you know. Um, and realistically, there's not even a support system for people to even meet all of those different bullet points. Um, yeah. Anything else you want to add? Yeah, I think, you know, what we see is when folks talk about the need for all these things to have uh, wraparound services, what we find is then the counter argument is then, well, now it costs too much now. We can't do it. 
Um, which, of course, is always going to cost too much because the government's always trying to cut costs when it comes to providing services for poor and working people. Um, but fundamentally, what we found is that with the simple is, is, instances of homeless eviction, what we find is that makes it almost nearly impossible for people to access the services that already exist, um, be it you know housing counseling, uh, counseling, job training programs, or pre-existing treatment programs. If social workers can't even find the client, there's no way to even invite them to use the program. So a very basic point is that we should be actually trying to create more stability, not uh, less stability. But at the same time, we also need you know, programs that have a relatively low uh, barrier for folks to enter and a diversity of solutions off the street. That means that you know, folks can be involved, be, uh, you know, can actually, you know, uh, safely uh, um, reside in informal communities before transitioning to some other aspect of health, some other next step of program. And let's let's do that. If some people can immediately be housed, well, let's do that. Um, however, what we find is an inability to actually take all these solutions seriously, and rather look for a one size fits all solution. So there's a real need to actually really educate the community about what actually it is the needs that people need to go for. Um, what actually is um, moving forward and how different things get in the way of that. I mean, proposition, uh, some of like in some of us that are worked in San Francisco worked in this one ballot measure, Proposition C, um, which was a wealth tax that was meant to go to homeless services. So there's all this energy that this is going to be the way to solve homelessness. And then after it was passed with 80% of the vote, mind you, very, very wide margin of success, it's still caught up in the court system. So for our basic effort, the basic issue is that you know, these corporations that got this new tax don't want to pay it and have the legal resources to hold up these new laws that pass with over 80% approval rate, 80% of people who voted for it voted yes on this ballot issue. So a handful of corporations are able to tie this up in the court system for the next five to six years. So it's actually unclear if it will be overturned or not. So think of that, like a year-long campaign to actually set aside something like over $100 million could potentially just go up in smoke just like that. And so what we really have to do is combat the mindset there's going to be a quick single solution. We're actually talking about getting people involved in political struggle at a lot of different levels, from a level of writing policy, through on the ground advocacy, to grassroots organizing, to meeting facilitation, to letter writing, to door knocking. But really, that's actually the wraparound services that we're actually talking about. Yeah, and just real quick, it's also not just corporations too, it is like the government itself as well. Like a, we've seen this time and time again with the city of San Francisco. If there aren't different corporations that will outright oppose different ballot measures that pass with you know overwhelming success, um, you know, the different members of the board of supervisors or the mayor will probably end up stepping in. And um, if the services do end up getting created, it'll only be partially funded. And it might take years for it to be fully implemented in the way that was imagined. And um, you know, I feel like oftentimes people are just like, well, if we had the right elected representatives, then it wouldn't really be this way. But the reality is you're talking about like a campaign that's gonna take like a dozen years just to get quote unquote the right people in office. And consistently we've seen in San Francisco it has this um, you know, this idea that it's like a very liberal, somewhat progressive city. Uh, but that's actually not true. It's actually extremely conservative. I've seen people who are supposedly progressive um, turn around and right away just talk about how they call the cops on homeless people because that's what their constituents want them to do, even though they campaigned on how they grew up, you know, and their mom was in, you know, a shelter and they really want to be an advocate for people who are out on the streets. Um, and that's, you know, more in line, like most, you know, unfortunately, we do feel like there is importance for um, you know these different progressive struggles to pop up but at the same time in, in the United States in general I would say there's just a real um, there's not a lot of clarity around what it what progressive really means you know I feel like that's something that to clarify with people so that way and just in general with different like you know terms that might come up like say you know like conservative or liberal or progressive or socialist or communist or anarchist or whatever you know, it's good to really like get down to the meat of this stuff. And I think it kind of goes back to the point I was bringing up earlier around like trying to find like political clarity, really struggling over these ideas, really trying to figure out what's really happening. Um, because it's, you know, you can work with a broad group of people if you're really clear about 
where they stand, what they really believe in, where they, what kind of work they see themselves doing. But um, if people are unclear on that or if they're being untruthful about that, that's when, you know, opportunism might come up. That's when, you know, people might be trying to take advantage of a situation for their own personal gain or to make themselves feel good instead of to actually, you know, progress the struggle in a way that's positive for, for everybody and for the struggle and so on. So, yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah, Thanks for having us. We'll also be here for a minute if anybody wants to talk to us. We definitely want to talk to some of y'all. Um, just hear what you have to and, say. And I'm